Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. As he indicated, uh, actually all three of my degrees are from Michigan State University and actually I was born in Battle Creek, Michigan and, and was in Michigan until 1976 uh, when I took a position at Penn State University and from there I, I left and, and went to uh, Mississippi State University and now I'm retired. And it's a pleasure to be here, it's a pleasure to be back to, to Michigan. In fact, my wife and I came back last spring for our 50th high school reunion, so uh, it, it was great to be back and, and we're real pleased to make the trip again. Uh, today I want to talk about bees and flowers. You might say, why are we going to talk about bees and flowers? First of all, you need to realize that the flowering plants, which we call angiosperms, and bees, not just honeybees, but all kinds of bees, co-evolved together. And they have developed a mutual relationship with each other. And so the bees benefit from the flowers, and the flowers benefit from the bees. And we're going to try to understand that relationship. We call it a, a flower-visitor relationship uh, better as we go through our presentation uh, this morning. As you work your bees, and as you study bee biology, and as you manage your colonies, you need to also understand the, the plant world as well. In fact, we often say to be a good beekeeper, you need to be a naturalist. You need to be a woodworker. There are many, 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 many things that, that you need to be. But you need to be a naturalist. You need to be in tune with nature and under, try to understand this relationship between the flowers and the bees. I'm going to concentrate this morning on nectar secretion. Nectar secretion is accomplished by many flowering species. It serves as an attractant to the bees, and we'll talk more about what nectar really is and nectaries, etc., in, in a few minutes. But you ought to be in, interested in the secretory cycle of flowers because it is the raw product of honey. Now, the honeybees may need 100, 150 pounds of honey to survive a year. Of course, you want another 75 or 100 or 150 pounds of honey per colony because uh, that's uh, one of your primary reasons, possibly, for keeping bees. And so you need to realize that the nectar that is secreted by the flowers is the raw product of honey, and we'll talk more about what takes place with that as well. So when I go to beekeeper meetings, especially in the spring, lots of people are questioning, uh, when is the nectar flow going to start? How long is it going to last? And how much money do I, or how much honey am I likely to produce? First of all, I want you to re realize that nectar flow and honey flow are one and the same. Um, and by a honey flow, we mean it's a time when the flowering plants of the area of the hives are producing surplus honey. And the bees are strong and able to take advantage of that surplus honey, and so as a result, they will be uh, storing a great deal of that honey, which you later can uh, go in and, and rob from the bees. Um, so, you know, we're always wondering, how much honey are my colonies going to produce this year? Is this going to be a good year? Is this going to be a bad year? And so we want to help you understand why some years are good and some years are not so good. If you were to analyze the honey that's produced by your colonies as surplus honey in which you're going to uh, harvest from the bees, you need to realize that probably the majority of that honey is going to come from two or three different floral sources. 
Yes, honeybees may visit several hundred species of flowering plants, but we have major honey plants and we have minor honey plants. Now the minor honey plants are extremely important to the bees for their source of food and for their development and producing large populations of bees that can go out and harvest that surplus honey as it becomes available. But the bulk of your honey crop is probably going to come from two or three different floral sources. So when, is the, when are these honey flows or nectar flows going to start? Ideally, we want to have colonies that are just stacked high with supers and that we want to produce a large surplus crop. Honey production is like a giant crossword puzzle. There are three key parameters associated with, with honey production. First of all, abundant floral sources. Now you, you can have some say in that by moving your hives from one area to another uh, in relation to the honey flows or to the flowering plants. But if you just put your colonies in the backyard, you will have to depend upon the floral sources of your particular area. And so you, the only, the only uh, advantage you have is if you want to move your hives uh, and scope out different areas to find suitable locations. Colony population. You as a beekeeper, as a bee manager, you have some say in how strong your colonies are going to be, how rapidly your colonies are going to build up in the spring. So you have, you have some effect on the size of your colonies and the size of the colony populations. The weather you have no impact or say in whatsoever. So you just have to take what nature provides. But what I want you to realize or come to understand during this presentation, the environmental factors, the weather factors, not only impact the development of colony populations, they also develop the, the flowering patterns of the, the plants as well. So the environmental factors affect both the bees and, and the floral sources. If I was talking about how can you produce a, a large crop of honey, and I think I'm giving that presentation tomorrow, we're going to talk about, first of all, you need to have strong colonies. Now for beginning beekeepers, a strong colony might be 10,000 bees. Because when they open it up and they see all those potential stingers, they think, wow, this is a strong colony. But 10,000 bees is actually a weak colony. By a strong colony, we mean we want to have between 40 and 60,000 bees in that colony. And I'll explain why in my presentation uh, tomorrow. So we literally want to have our colonies boiling over with bees if we're going to be successful in producing a large crop of honey. We have to have adequate bee forage or flowering plants. We have to have good secretion and flight weather. As we said, the weather affects both the bees as well as the flowering plants. And you need to provide ample space for storage and handling of nectar. When the nectar is brought in by the bees, it may have as high as 70 or 80 percent water. But we know in the final product, honey is about approximately 17 percent moisture. And so the bees have to do away with all of that excess moisture. Now the point here is, when they bring in the nectar, they've got to have some place to step temporarily store it until it is fully ripened or processed into the final product, honey. And so all that additional water that ultimately is going to be evaporated by the bees has to be, have a place to be temporarily stored. And so we would always say to you, in the spring we would recommend that you over-super. 
In the fall, as we want them to consolidate their, their honey stores for winter, then we would recommend that you under-super, crowd them and force them to, to consolidate the, their honey. But the key here is, if you're going to produce 60 pounds of honey, you've got to provide more space than what that 60 pounds of honey uh, will take up because all of that water that ultimately will be temporarily stored. We have to get our colonies in peak condition if we're going to take advantage of the local honey flows. And so, as I said, you need to be in tune with nature. You need to know what is going on within your, your colony of bees. Ideally, you have to have maximum populations. And I mentioned 40 to 60,000. We found that you get your greatest payoff from the standpoint of honey production if you have between 40 and 60,000 bees. And as I indicated, I'll explain that further uh, tomorrow. But you also have to have correct timing. You get your colonies in peak condition and you have them at that point, say by July 15th, but the hunt major, major honey flow for your particular area ended on May 15th, you just lost the ball game. And so timing, you have to be familiar with what are the major honey flows of your particular area. When are they likely to bloom? And so then you've got to manage your colonies appropriately so that you can have your colonies in peak condition to take advantage uh, of that, that local flow. I've already indicated we have major floral sources. What I want you to realize, if we're looking at what are the impacts on honey production, the environment has a much greater impact than your management. But if you don't adequately do your management, then you're going to lose out in part of the potential production of your hives. But the environment is the biggest factor involved in honey production. I said I would define what nectar is. Nectar is basically a solution of sugars with other components that give it its unique color, flavor, and aroma. So it's made up of primarily three sugars, glucose, fructose, and sucrose. Organic acids, amino acids, proteins, organic oils, and there's always pollen mixed in with it as well. But you need to basically think that, that nectar secretion is primarily a solution of, of sugars. We have two types of nectaries in the plant world. A nectary is the structure of the plant that is responsible for the secretion of nectar. We have floral nectaries, and we have what are called extra floral nectaries. Floral nectaries are found somewhere within the flower. Extra floral nectaries are found outside of the flower maybe on the stems, maybe on the leaf bracts. An example of a plant that has extra floral nectaries is cotton. But cotton also has flowers. And so cotton has both floral and extra floral nectaries. But when the cotton is not blooming, the bees can still be visiting the plant and collecting uh, nectar from it. While I did my master's at, at Michigan State, I studied, <clears throat> excuse me, anyway, I studied nectar secretion in pickling cucumbers and the <clears throat> effect of nectar secretion on pollination. And this is a male or staminate cucumber flower. In cucumbers, you have male flowers and you have female flowers. And you see this, this button-shaped structure below the anthers or stamens. That is the, the nectary, and that's where nectar secretion occurs in the male flower. Here we have the female flower. This is the stigma. This is a cup-shaped nectary, <clears throat> and you'll see the liquid nectar uh, 
located in the cup. If you look at the structure or the surface of the nectary tissue, you'll see it's covered with pores. This was taken with a scanning electron microscope, and you can see the pores through which the nectar uh, is secreted onto the, the nectary surface. It secretes both sugars as well as, as water. Now, we use tiny capillary pipettes, as you see here, to measure the cucumber nectar from the flowers. And you can think of the capillary pipette as being equivalent to the bee's tongue or proboscis. And so we measured the volume of nectar in thousands and thousands of cucumber flowers while I were, was doing uh, my masters and trying to figure out what factors of affected nectar secretion. This is the bee's tongue or proboscis as I mentioned here. And the honeybee goes into the flower, places its proboscis down onto the, the surface of the nectary tissue and removes all of the nectar present. And we discovered that if the bee is not disturbed while it's in the flower and, and removing the nectar, it will remove all of the liquid nectar that is present um, and then it goes on to another flower. And that flower will not be visited with, for maybe two, three minutes and then suddenly the flower becomes attractive again. So the, the ability of that flower to re-secrete nectar is a very rapid event. But the other thing we learned over the course of the day as the flower is visited over and over and over, the sugar concentration of the nectar available to the bee uh, declines over time. And so the, the nectar becomes more and more dilute as it is uh, secreted uh, by the flowers. Again, when the bee uh, removes all of the nectar uh, and temporarily stores it in this structure right here within the, the anterior part of the abdomen. We call that the honey stomach. In insects in general, we would call that the crop. But it's, it's a honey stomach or, or crop. It's a temporary storage organ. And so when this becomes filled with nectar, then the forager returns to the hive to disperse its load of nectar uh, to the house bees. Just to show you, and I briefly mentioned this, just to show you what is expected that's going to happen in the ripening of nectar uh, into honey. Nectar, as we say, is somewhere between 50 to 80 percent water. And through the fanning of the bees, that ultimately gets reduced. As we said, honey is typically 17 percent or 16 to 18 uh, percent moisture. But there's also a change, there's also a change in the sugar composition of the nectar. The honeybees add an enzyme. Now the old beekeeping literature would call that enzyme invertase. Today we would call it sucrase. And it's an enzyme that splits the sucrose molecule or the sugar molecule into two six carbon sugars. Now let me just explain that a bit further. Sucrose table sugar is a 12 carbon molecule. The enzyme causes that 12 carbon molecule to be broken into two six carbon sugars. And those sugars would be glucose and fructose. And so sucrose plus invertase or sucrase will ultimately give you glucose and fructose. And we'll see that uh, that glucose and fructose in another slide is, is dominant in comparison to sucrose in the final product, uh, honey. Um, in fact, here it is. I, the top line is cucumber nectar as it was measured uh, in the field. Sucrose was 24%, fructose was 10%, glucose was 6%, and water 
uh, was 59%. This is the average over thousands and thousands of flowers. But honey, the American composition, or the composition of American honey, is only 1.3% sucrose. So you see sucrose dominant nectars are ultimately changed into fructose and glucose, and fructose went from 10% to 38%, and glucose went from 6% to 32%, and as I said, the, the equivalent reduction uh, in moisture. So this is the composition of American honey, that bottom line there, and you can see that sucrose is only there in very small proportions. When a field bee returns with a full load of nectar, she begins to disperse her load to various house bees. She just doesn't come in and throw it into a cell, so to speak. She comes in and she gives one droplet to this house bee, she gives another droplet to this house bee, and she, so she dispenses her whole load in the form of droplets to numerous bees. These are house bees, and this is where the, the ripening process will be, begin. Let me just lay this down for a second. The bees' mandibles go up and down, or excuse me, go sideways. Ours goes up and down, right? Mandibles, jaws, that's what we're talking about. The bees uh, go sideways. And so they receive a droplet of nectar, and then they begin to stretch this nectar. They begin to add invertase or sucrase to it. But they may manipulate a droplet of nectar for 10, 15 minutes. And then they will go place it in a cell, as I will show you here. So they're going to add an enzyme, and they're going to begin the evaporation process. This exchanging of food or exchanging of nectar between bees we call trophallaxis. As I indicated to you, after the bee has manipulated that droplet of nectar for several minutes, it then goes and hangs it up to dry, so to speak, on the roof of a cell, like hanging out wet laundry. Okay? And through fanning action over the next few days, the, the moisture content of these droplets uh, will be reduced. And once the moisture content gets down, the bees gather their droplets and, and add them to a cell, as you see here. And when a cell is full and it is completely ripened, then they're going to put a wax capping over it. Now wax cappings are very porous and so as a result even though they've reduced the moisture level somewhere between 16 and 18 percent if it's prevailing high humidity as that honey is stored it will absorb moisture and it will move right through uh, the uh, porous cappings. When I judge honey shows if it's been an extremely wet year, I expect that the, the moisture levels of the honey that I measure with a refractometer are going to be much higher than years when it's really hot and dry. And so honey is hygroscopic. It exchanges moisture with the environment. And it goes through uh, this, this wax covering. Honeybees will not cap a cell of honey until it is fully ripened. And it's to keep it clean and keep it pure until you are ready to extract it. Now to the bees, nectar is their carbohydrate supply. It's their sugar supply. It's their source of energy. But as we said to you, it's the raw product of honey. When bees visit flowers for nectar, Lots of times they will also collect pollen, and we see the pollen pellet here on the hind leg of this forager. 
So some will collect nectar only, some will collect pollen only, others will collect both. And that's all part of this flower-visitor relationship and that the flower is offering food to the bee to attract it so that it can benefit from these uh, flower visits. Honeybees have a natural hoarding instinct. And we like to take advantage of that natural hoarding instinct. Every day that conditions will allow, the bees will go out and work as though the cupboard is bare. Now if we look at bumblebees in comparison, there will be in the brood nest of a bumblebee nest, there will be three or four uh, honey cups. And when the honey cups are full, they stay at home and take it easy. Okay? But honeybees have this natural hoarding instinct and they go out every day that weather permits and work as hard as they possibly can. So this is the beginning of this flower visitor relationship that we've talked about and we need to examine it further. A honeybee is attracted to a floral source and we're talking about long-range attraction now, by visual cues. The color, the shape, and the size of the flower. So initially then they are attracted uh, by these visual cues. Close range orientation. As the bee gets close to a flower, as it actually approaches a particular flower and goes in uh, to remove the food supply, orientation is handled by the, the odor that the flower is emitting, what we call nectar and pollen guides. And I'll show you an example of a, a nectar guide in, in a few minutes. There are floral patterns, reflection of ultraviolet light, which man cannot see but bees can see. There are patterns on the surface of the flower that directs the bee to either nectar or pollen, and as we call them, nectar guides. In other words, the bee is given a road map into the flower to obtain the, the uh, reward in the form of, of food. And these nectar and pollen guides are based on light reflection and principally um, ultraviolet light, as I said, which we cannot see. All right, here we have a cucumber flower. As you look at that cucumber flower, it looks yellow to you, doesn't it? But if I take cucumber flowers and I put an ultraviolet filter on the camera and then take a picture of the cucumber flowers, that is what you actually see. So that tells us that there's the male flower on the left, the female flower on the right, but you'll notice these great big bullseyes, so to speak. So what we're telling you is the center of the flower, even though it looks yellow to us, it is reflecting ultraviolet light, which was removed by the filter that I placed on the camera. So basically the outside is reflecting ultraviolet and yellow light but the center is reflecting only ultraviolet light. And it doesn't take any dummy too long to come to realize, if I hit the bullseye, there's a reward waiting for me. And so the foragers learn very quickly. And this is the bee actually going in to remove the, the nectar supply. The type of forage that the bees collect is going to be depend upon the colony itself. It's going to depend somewhat on the brood, on the queen, and on the amount of food that is already stored. And so bees, when they go out, am I going to collect pollen? Am I going to collect nectar? Or am I going to collect both? And what we're saying to you is that these three conditions affect what the foragers will actually collect. You have to have a queen laying a large number of eggs 
for the bees to go out and collect pollen. If you would go into a queenless colony and examine the pollen stores, you would find there's not fresh pollen being brought in. It's kind of wet and glossy in appearance, looks old in appearance. There's not fresh pollen being, in, being brought in. And the reason for that is one, the presence of a laying queen, but more importantly, the presence of young brood, which produces pheromones, which we call brood pheromones, and some of those components of brood pheromone is going to stimulate pollen collection. And the amount that's already stored also affects their behavior. Now, that's how the biology of the hive affects foraging behavior but what's available to the bees will also affect their foraging behavior. They may need to go out and collect pollen, but if there's not a pollen source available close by, they're gonna go out and collect nectar, okay? But ideally, there, it's a complex relationship between the brood, the queen, the food stores, and the foragers in the field. Now in the case of nectar, as we said, it's primarily a source of sugars. The bees receive what we call a caloric reward. Some of us count calories. Some of us should count calories. <laughs> and if we're trying to lose weight, we're going to reduce our intake of calories. But for the bees, they want to go out and visit the floral sources that are most profitable to them. And profitability of a particular floral source is dependent upon the nectar that is collected, how many calories does it offer. As we studied nectar secretion, we were concerned about the volume of nectar. We were concerned about the sugar concentration of that nectar. And we had a formula that if we could consider the volume and the sugar concentration, then we could determine the total weight of sugar present in that nectar sample or the caloric reward that the bees were going to uh, get. And so the profitability of different floral sources uh, is going to be dependent upon the caloric reward. Why should I fly out into the field and visit a floral source that only is offering 20% sugar in comparison when there's another floral source readily available that's offering 40% sugar? So the bees are going to consider profitability both on sugar concentration, on volume, as well as caloric reward, as I've, as I've already talking, uh, talked about. The other aspect that we need to realize, different floral sources, different plant sources, have different sugar compositions. Worldwide, flowering plants basically offer three types of nectar. There are sucrose dominant nectars, there are some flowering plants that produce nectar that is about equal in sucrose, glucose, and fructose. And then we have fructose and glucose dominant nectars. Those are the three basic types of nectars. The majority of the floral sources that you would have in Michigan are probably going to be sucrose dominant. But you see, which sugars are present, and the ratio of those sugars is going to affect foraging behavior. It's going to affect which floral source is most attractive to the bees. Many studies have looked at the attractiveness of different sugars to bees. This is just one example, and most of these studies will find, have found that sucrose is more attractive to honeybees than either glucose or fructose. But whether glucose comes next 
or fructose comes next is highly variable from one plant source uh, to another and, and from uh, the different studies that have been done. If you offer bees equal concentrations of the three sugars, they will always find the sucrose to be more attractive than the other two. That's equal concentrations now. The shape and the size of the flower is going to affect the bee's behavior in collecting it. This is a blueberry flower. We often think of blueberries as being bumblebee flowers because it requires a long tongue and bumblebees have longer tongues than honeybees. But there are some varieties of blueberries where the shape of the, the flower uh, is such that the bees can take real advantage of it and uh, do a good job of pollinating. When, as I say, I grew up in Michigan, and I know that beekeepers took, routinely, took their colonies to blueberry plantations uh, in the spring and could always count on producing one or two supers of honey uh, from the blueberry plantation. But the big problem was they usually had a serious outbreak of European fall brood after they removed the bees from the, the blueberry plantation. And Dr. Hoopengarner and, and one of his students spent a lot of time studying that, and it was found to be related to the acidity of the uh, blueberry nectar uh, and allowing the bacterium that causes European fowl brood to, to germinate. But the point here is honeybees can greatly benefit blueberry pollination. But some varieties are more difficult than others because the corolla or the flower shape of the flower is much longer, and so the shorter tongue honeybees do not have near the impact. As we look at different plant species, we can say what the characteristics of the nectar supply produced by these different floral sources, uh, how they're going to vary. Um, the shape of the flower. As I just said, the size of the flower. Something like white sweet clover has very small flowers, but has a, a large supply of nectar, and the bees can quickly visit numerous small flowers and get a load of nectar. Um, the color of the flowers. In other words, there's some genetic aspects of, of nectar secretion, as well as environmental aspects associated with nectar secretion. And so if we look at the genetics of it, we, and I say tulip poplar, you immediately know what a tulip poplar flower looks like. You immediately know something about the size of that flower. You immediately know what color that flower is going to be because that's all determined genetically by that particular plant species. You, you can even have an estimate of how many flowers a particular size plant may produce. And we can even speculate as to how much nectar those flowers are going to produce, whether it's a good nectar producer or not. But all the other aspects of secretion, nectar secretion, is affected uh, by the environment. What I want you to realize, and this is part of our difficulty in understanding nectar secretion, is that in some cases it's not an immediate effect or an immediate impact. Because flowering is one of the later events in the life of a plant, in the season of a plant. So basically we could say that any environmental factor that's had an effect on the plant during growth, during development, leading up to blooming, may, may very well impact nectar secretion. And we don't always think in broad terms. We think, you know, 
well, this has been a beautiful week weather-wise. Why aren't my why aren't my bees working the white clover? Well, what we're saying to you is something probably has impacted white clover long before it started to bloom that may either negatively or positively uh, be affecting um, nectar secretion. Nectar secretion is related to the process known as photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the, is the process in which plants produce sugar. And what I want you to realize, the key components here that affect the production of sugar likewise ultimately affect nectar secretion. Carbon dioxide plus water in the presence of light, green chlorophyll or the green pigment in plants, produces sugar and oxygen. Now, as you look at that formula, we're going to say that Probably light is going to be the biggest factor that affects uh, nectar secretion, or we'll call it solar radiation, and water supply to the plant. Is the plant in a drought condition, or is it have too much water, or is it just right? So water and light both are going to affect nectar secretion. So as I said, the number one factor is solar radiation. However, some of the flowering trees produce nectar in the spring before they produce leaves. So the, the quality of the nectar that's produced this year it's going to be dependent upon the carbohydrates that were stored by the plant last year. Stored carbohydrates. So it's last year that's going to impact nectar secretion this year if it's before photosynthesis can occur. There needs to be a balance between vegetative growth and reproductive development. And I always like to use the sweet corn example. Some years you plant sweet corn and they grow real tall and lush, ideal conditions for growth. What's the quality of the sweet corn ears? Not so good because the plant put all the bulk of its energy into growth and not into reproduction. So luscious, beautiful plant, but the ears aren't so hot. Other years, the sweet corn maybe only gets this high, but the ears are loaded with kernels. Okay? Now, those are the two extremes. What I'm saying is we need a balance between vegetative growth and reproduction or the development of the, the ears themselves. This is true for all plants. You know, we could go out, we could have a field of, we could have a field of clover. And we could go out and we could put fer a lot of fertilizer on it. Well, that fertilizer, especially the nitrogen, might very well cause a lot of growth and development of the plant itself, but not necessarily in nectar secretion or ultimately seed production. So we need a balance. Nature needs to provide a balance for the bulk of our honey sources. As I said, some may choose on some crops to increase the productivity of them, may use commercial fertilizers. It may ultimately have a negative impact on the potential nectar secretion of that particular crop. Generally, if you go back and study honey production records over a number of years, you will find the best honey production seasons are when we had clear weather. 
Clear weather is good for both nectar secretion and bee flight. Temperature has a lot to do with nectar secretion in different ways, which we'll talk about in just a minute. First of all, temperature is going to affect the bee's behavior in foraging. Bee flight is drastically re reduced below 50 degrees Fahrenheit and above 100. When it gets up around 100, they switch from foraging for nectar and go to collecting water to air condition uh, the hive. But there's very little flight activity below 50. Strong colonies do little foraging below 55. Weak colonies do little foraging below 60. So temperature affects be foraging, as we're going to learn, temperature also affects uh, nectar secretion. This is a cucumber flower in Michigan on a cool, wet day in the middle of the summer. Probably a little cooler than it is today, but conditions somewhat similar to what we have outside today. That flower never opened. Why did that flower not open? Because temperatures did not get high enough to cause it to open. And we discovered as we were studying floral biology that the threshold temperature for flower anthesis or flower opening was 59 degrees. So if it only got up to 56 today, that whole field of cucumbers, the flowers would not open. Nectar secretion did not begin until 61 degrees. And basically, first foraging began at 62, but if we really wanted a large population of bees foraging on the cucumbers, it had to be 70 or above. But you see how temperature affects not only flowering and nectar secretion, it also, as I indicated, affects foraging behavior uh, as well. As I told you, we measured the nectar in flowers over two and a half summers, day after day after day. And I just want, I don't like showing graphs at bee meetings, but I just want to show you how closely related nectar secretion and temperature were on this particular summer. And this was July and August. July 26th, to August 26. The, the bottom line is the average volume of nectar. Now we measured equal numbers of female and male flowers, okay? The bottom line for a given day is the average volume of nectar and it's, micro, it's measured in microliters, but you don't need to worry about that. Okay, now the top line was the maximum temperature that was reached that day. So the middle line was the average temperature that day. And the bottom line was the minimum temperature. Now just look at the pattern there and see the volume of nectar, how it related to temperature. You, you couldn't ask for those to be any closer, could you? In fact, somebody say, is that data fixed? <laughs> it, it looks too good. But this is what, what we, we got over that period of time. If you look again at, at the old literature and honey production records, you will generally find that days that have high daytime temperatures and low night temperatures are ideal for honey production. Why? During the day when we've got high temperatures, we assume we've got a lot of solar radiation, sunshine, okay? And so during the course of the day, the plant is producing a lot of sugar for nectar. Low temperatures at night means the metabolism of the plant slows down. And so it doesn't burn up a lot of the sugar that was produced during the day. So that surplus sugar ultimately will 
a lot of it will become part of the nectar that will be made available uh, to uh, the bees maybe ne tomorrow and then the next day or two, three days from now. And so high day tem temperatures, low night temperatures is, is good for honey production. Soil moisture. We have to have adequate soil moisture. We said water was very, very important in that formula for photosynthesis and the production of sugars, but we can have too much and so that the roots of the plants cannot get enough oxygen. And they can literally drown. And so we can have too much, we can have uh, too little. So soil moisture is important. I'm not going to go into it, but soil pH is important. There are areas in Ohio where white clover produces excellent honey crops. And there are other areas in Ohio that have a lot of white clover, but they do not produce good honey crops. And they, studies have shown it's related to soil pH. You need a very basic soil, a, 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 a high pH to have the best nectar secretion. Each plant in, in its relationship to, to soil pH will, will vary each plant species, but that's just one example. Rain. Well, rain number one keeps the bees at home. Rain number two, if the flowers are open, dilutes the nectar. Or rain in some types of flowers may even wash the nectar right out of the flower. So too much rain is going to have a negative effect on nectar secretion. As I said, soil type, soil pH is also important. Relative humidity does not have an impact, a direct impact on nectar secretion. However, it has an impact on the quality of the nectar over the course of the day. The nectar is secreted into the flowers. If the bees are not collecting it, and it's a high humidity day, that nectar does not evaporate, the water content of that nectar does not evaporate very fast, and so it remains dilute or of a low sugar concentration. But if it's a <clears throat> bright sunny day in which uh, the nectar, uh, it, the water of the nectar is evaporating rapidly over the course of the day, the sugar concentration of the nectar will go up, and so will the attractiveness of the nectar uh, to the bees. We said honey is hygroscopic, exchanges moisture with the environment. Likewise, the raw product of honey is likewise uh, exchanges moisture with, with the environment as well. And so that just determines the sugar concentration post-secretion uh, in the flower. Wind. Wind, again, affects uh, the uh, rate of evaporation of the nectar within the flower. Wind, let me go back, wind also affects the foraging behavior of the bees. And so high windy days are going to reduce foraging. Uh, low wind days or calm days are going to be much better for foraging. Tried to point out to you that nectar secretion is a very complex process that is affected both genetically and environmentally. And if we would take a particular plant species and study nectar secretion of that particular plant species, we would see that differences occur in relation to the sex of the flower in relation to the flower position on the plant. You know, some plants, and apples, strawberries would be good examples. Sometimes we have primary flowers, secondary flowers, tertiary flowers. Well, a primary flower is going to be a much better nectar producer than a secondary or a tertiary flower. And it has to do where are those flowers located on the plant in relation to the phloem and xylem or the vascular system of, of the plant because ultimately the, the sugar that's in the nectar is going to come 
from the vascular supply and from photosynthesis, as we've already uh, indicated. The age of the flower is going to affect uh, the nectar content. The varieties, some varieties are, uh, say, some varieties of soybeans are very good nectar producers. Other varieties are not. Blueberries. There are some blueberry varieties that you, you, you will never see a bee on. In fact, they've had to use gibberellic acid or, or some other promoter to get adequate pollination because bees are not attracted to them. And so there are big differences in varieties, big differences in plant species, big differences in plant density well, within a, a patch of flowers. All of these factors, in addition to, to solar radiation, uh, wind, moisture, etc., are going to affect nectar secretion. Now, as we said, the plants are offering the bees a reward for visiting them because ultimately they want to reproduce. They want to have pollination to occur so that they can reproduce. And so they're offering this reward, either in the form of nectar or in the fo form of pollen to get the bees or the visitors, the pollinators, to come and visit that particular flower. Once pollination is achieved in a flower, nectar secretion stops. Okay? So if we've got yellow sweet clover out there, well, we've got terrible weather. Yellow sweet clover may hang on for several weeks because it hasn't achieved adequate pollination and hasn't stopped uh, attracting pollinators and, and stopped producing nectar. However, if pollination occurs rapidly over a two or three day period, suddenly you realize the yellow sweet clover is dried up and it's into producing seed now. So what I'm telling you is nectar secretion in most plants stops soon after pollination occurs. This bee yard was was actually this way. We've got weak colonies and we've got strong colonies. If we put pollen traps on those colonies, we might find that the pollen that's being brought in by those four colonies is highly variable in color because they are, have different foraging patterns uh, even though they're in the same bee yard, they have different foraging patterns and ultimately they're visiting different uh, plant species. And as we've said, the condition of the brood, the condition of the queen, the amount of reproduction that's occurring in those colonies will ultimately affect their foraging behavior. And so just looking at this, we would say the, the three on your left are probably much in much better condition than the, the, the lower one that's obviously a weak colony. Likewise, we would say we would expect the most honey to be produced by this one, second, third, fourth. So the colony conditions or we call it colony morale, and I'll, I'll throw that up there in just a minute, affects foraging behavior. As we said, you've got to have large populations of bees, number one. Your timing has to be correct. You've got to have those peak populations available when your major nectar flows are occurring. And of course, the queen needs to be reproducing at a maximum rate, and the number of eggs she lays is going to be dependent upon the size of the nurse bee population, the brood nest temperature, and whether or not fresh nectar and pollen are coming in. Sometimes we stimulate colonies early in the spring through stimulatory feeding uh, to try to get them to develop faster and quicker. The colonies with good colony morale are the one going to be the most productive colonies. And by colony morale, we mean making a maximum number of foraging trips every day during the honey flow. 
Now we would ask ourselves as B managers, what is going to negatively impact colony morale? The desire to swarm. If I was lecturing today on swarm management, I would tell you three to four weeks before a colony actually swarms, that colony is going downhill, and I would explain to you in what ways it was going downhill. We would say it has poor colony morale. If the queen is failing and they are needing to supersede her, that's going to reduce colony morale. We need to have a balance of bees of different ages. And as we've indicated, we have to have adequate living and ripening space. In other words, adequate numbers of supers. Uh, all of these uh, factors are going to affect colony morale. What's the take home message? I've tried to show you today that nectar secretion, which is so important to us from the standpoint of, of honey production, is a very complex process. It's a process that's affected both by the genetics of the plant species involved as well as environmental conditions. Not only do environmental conditions impact plant development, plant flowering, nectar secretion, environmental conditions also affect the bees' development, growth, and ultimate foraging behavior. It's a very, very complex process. And so back to the original questions. When is the honey flow going to start? How long will this honey flow last? How much surplus honey should I anticipate making? Sorry, folks. I'm afraid the bees and the flowers are going to keep you guessing. Have a great day.